Hey, Game Dev Enjoyers, Pixuk here. Recently, well, not that recently because I was busy taking care of the Discord server and the slaying enemies in Darkest Dungeon, but more seriously, I made a video about the stance buffer in Unity and some of you asked for a tutorial. As usual, I will consider that you know the Unity basics, otherwise I would recommend checking out the Black Thorns Brots channel for example to get used to Unity in general. Anyways, here's how the Stancy Buffer works in Unity, URP and some of its applications. We will see first the theory, then how to cut holes in things, then how to make an impossible geometry, and finally how to create a magic card. First, let me quickly explain how the Stancy Buffer works in Unity. The Stancy Buffer is basically an integer between 0 and 255 associated to each pixel of the screen. When rendering, each object can then check and manipulate the stencil buffer values covered by its mesh. For instance, for each pixel that an object geometry would cover, we can check the value stored in the stencil buffer and render the object accordingly. When I say accordingly, I mean that for each object that is rendered and for each pixel that its geometry covers, we verify an equation involving a value used for the comparison and the current stencil buffer value in that pixel. This is called a stencil test, and if the test is true, then the pixel of the object geometry is rendered. Otherwise, if the test is false, the pixel of the object geometry is skipped, which means that it is not rendered at all. The value used for the comparison and for writing into the stencil buffer is called the ref value. I insist on the end because the ref value is used for both reading and writing. Besides, the comparison function used in the stencil test to compare the ref value and the stencil buffer values is called the comp and here's a list of the comparison operations we can perform between a current stencil buffer value and the ref value. I will take for example the rendering of this object with a ref value of 2 to show you how it's done. Never, the comparison is always false, so we never render the object geometry pixels, less we render the object's geometry pixels only where the ref value is less than the current stencil buffer value, equal these two values are equal, L equal, which is less or equal, greater, the ref value is greater than the current stencil buffer value, not equal, these two values are not equal, G equal, which is greater or equal, and finally, always, the comparison is always true, so we always render the object geometry pixels if that's possible. I put you a link in the description for the comparison operations documentation. As I said before, if the comparison is true for a pixel, then the object mesh renders on that pixel. We say in that case that the pixel passes the stencil test, and we can configure the operation to perform on the stencil buffer in that case by referencing the pass command. Otherwise, we can also configure the operation to perform on the stencil buffer if the stencil test fails by referencing the fail command. Here's a list of the three main operations, well, my three favorites, we can perform on the stencil buffer value. I will take for example an object with a ref value of 2 and that always passes to show you how it works. Keep, which is keeping the current stencil buffer value. Zero which is replacing the current stencil buffer value by a zero, and replace, which is replacing the current stencil buffer value by the ref value. You can check the other stencil operations on the Unity documentation, and I put you a link in the description for that. As an example, you can declare that if the value stored in the stencil buffer is less than 10, then the object should not render on these pixels, but instead store a zero in the associated stencil buffer values. So in that example, we would check if the stencil buffer values are greater than 10 to render our object. So we'll use the greater comparison function because we want our stencil test to pass only where the ref value is greater than the stencil buffer values. Then, if the stencil test fails, which means that the object is not rendered on these pixels, we put a zero in the associated stencil buffer value using the fail command. Finally, a more advanced method to configure the stencil tests and operations is by referencing the read mask and write mask values, which are also both integers from 0 to 255, 
Before jumping right into it, just a disclaimer to tell you that this part won't be useful for the tutorial so you can skip it to that timestamp if you're not interested. The read mask value is used as a beat mask for the ref and the current stencil buffer values only during the stencil test. That means that the final compare values would be then the resulting values after masking them. For example, let's say that we want to write a value of 3 into our stencil buffer for every stencil buffer value that is an uneven number. An uneven integer always contains a 1 on its first bit of its binary representation, like 3, our ref value. Then we can set the read mask value to 1 so that the resulting value after masking every uneven integer, such as 3, our ref value, or 5, or 7, 9, or 11, would be 1. The stencil test would then test if the stencil buffer values covered by the object geometry after masking them by the read mask value are equal to our ref value after masking it, which is also 1, and if that's the case, the stencil test passes, otherwise it fails. Regarding the write mask value, it also acts as a bit mask for the ref value, but only during a stencil operation. Then, instead of writing directly the ref value into the stencil buffer, you can write another value into the stencil buffer that would be the resulting value after masking the ref value. For example, let's say that we want to check if the stencil buffer values are equal to 7, but we also want to write a 4 when the stencil test fails. Then our ref value would be 7, and we can set the write mask value to 4, because the resulting value after masking the ref value would be 4 too. The stencil operation would then use 4 instead of 7 for writing into the stencil buffer. To summarize, we have to use 7 as the ref value with the equal comparison operation, then use a value of 4 for the write mask value, and lastly, we have to reference the fail command to write a 4 in the stencil buffer values where the stencil test failed. Okay, okay, let's count down a bit now. Another way of controlling how an object should be rendered is using the depth buffer, i.e. the distance between the camera and the object mesh pixel that is rendered. You can check for example if that distance is greater than other rendered object pixels, which means that the pixel of the object we want to render is behind other objects. This test is called Z-Test and is executed after the stencil test. If the Z-Test passes, the object geometry pixels are rendered, but if the test fails, the object pixels are not rendered, but we can perform a stencil operation on these pixels by referencing the z fail operation, which is a stencil operation such as the one used in the pass and fail commands. By the way, we cannot z-test transparent and invisible objects, and this is basically due to how Unity handles the transparent rendering. We will see why this is important later in the video. Anyways, now we'll see how to interact with the stencil buffer, how to set values in the stencil buffer, and how to read them. Before anything else, we have to do a very important thing. We have to go in settings, then into the UAP renderer settings your project is configured with. By default, this is the high fidelity one. Now disable the depth priming, because otherwise we won't be able to use the stencil buffer. This is an issue someone on the Discord server encountered and for which we spend a lot of time trying to fix it. Anyways, now to set values into the stencil buffer, two approaches are possible. On the one hand, we can use shaders to do that. For instance, a common use case of the stencil buffer is a simple shader that always sets the stencil buffer values covered by its mesh to a certain value while being invisible. This is especially useful for our applications because it works as an invisible mask for object geometries. To use the stencil buffer through a shader, we simply have to add the stencil section into the pass section of the subshader. Every command related to the stencil buffer will then be placed here. You can actually add the stencil section in whatever shader you want, like this one. This shader is an opaque UOP shader that is simply about referencing a value we will write into the stencil buffer values covered by its mesh, regardless of the values already stored in the stencil buffer. Finally, we set it invisible, so we also have to disable Z writing because we cannot Z test it. By the way, this shader is in description, just in case. On the other hand, we can directly use the render features in the UAP renderer settings to render an object and set the stencil buffer values covered by its mesh to another value. 
This prevents us from writing a shader and allows us to use any material we want for the object material, but then we have to make sure to use the right settings for that. Also, it is not possible to configure the read mask and the write mask values using directly the UAP render settings, but we will never need them in the tutorial, so it doesn't matter. Anyways, now we are ready to start our first stencil buffer application, cutting a hole in the ground. For this tutorial, I will use the shader method to set the stencil buffer values, but feel free to use the render feature technique too. Now that we know how to set values in the stencil buffer, we will see how to interact with them with the first example, cutting a hole in the ground. The idea is extremely simple. We first render a mask for the hole and set the stencil buffer values covered by the mask mesh to a value. Then we render the ground where the stencil buffer values are not equal to the mask stencil buffer value and eventually we render the whole sites for a better look. For that, we first have to create a layer for the ground rendering that we will use later. Now we have to create two different 3D models, one for the whole entries and one for the whole sites. You can perform this either by using a 3D modeling software such as Blender or by using directly Unity tools like the handy Pro Builder. Don't worry, I will show you both. In Blender, you can actually create two models in one, which is even more convenient. To make a simple through hole, create a cylinder and set its position to minus one on the Z axis. In the edit mode, select the top and bottom faces and separate them from the cylinder by pressing P, then selection. Now select the side faces and invert their normals by doing mesh, normals, flip. Now export the object in FBX in Unity and that's all for Blender. Regarding Pro Builder, this is also fairly simple. First, we have to import it from the package manager by doing window, package manager and install it from the Unity registry. Then open the ProBuilder window by doing Tools, ProBuilder, ProBuilder window and create a new poly shape. Create the shape you want, for instance we can create a crack, extrude it in the negative direction, invert its normals, then select the top and bottom faces by pressing Shift plus selecting them and click on Detach faces. Invert the normals of the created object again. You should have now two different game objects one for the whole entries and one for the whole sites. You can then parent one of them to the other to make it more convenient when moving the hole around. That's all. By the way, it is not necessary at all to use only a poly shape. You can use, for instance, the cylinder shape as well. Just be creative. Anyways, now we have to create the mask material for the whole entries. We will use the mask shader we talked about earlier for that. After recopying or importing the shader, create a material from it by right-clicking, create material. Now apply this material to the whole entries and set its stencil ref value, for example with a 1. You shouldn't see any difference and this is because the ground is currently rendered regardless of the stencil buffer values. So, to make sure the ground will not render where the stencil buffer values are equal to the whole entry's stencil ref value, first we have to apply a layer to the ground and then we have to create a render feature for the ground. For that, you have to go in the URP render settings, then disable the default rendering for the ground layer. For that, in the filtering section, uncheck the ground layer in the opaque and transparent layer masks. The ground visual should have now disappeared, and this is intended since we are not rendering it anymore. Then we have to create a render feature to render the ground. Still in the URP render settings, click on add render feature, then render objects. Call that render feature as you wish, and make sure the event is set to after rendering opaques, because we want to render the ground after the whole entries. Now in the filtering section, make sure the queue is set to opaque, unless your ground is uh, using a transparent material, then select your ground layer in the mask field. In the overrides section, check the stencil check mark and set its value to the value you set into your mask material. Now select the not equal comparison function and for a better visual look, I would also recommend disabling the ground shadow casting. Now you may be wondering how to make the physics 
related to the hall. This is basically the same method as the one used in the Interactive Shadows tutorial, go check it out if you haven't seen it already. The only thing we have to do here is to create a triggerable collider for the hole, then create a script that deactivates the ground collider on trigger. For the collider, we can create a game object that has a mesh collider component which uses the whole mesh. We also need to set it convex and triggerable to make it work, as well as setting its position correctly. For the script, create a C-sharp script that you will call for example uh, Disable Collider on Trigger, apply it to the whole Collider game object and open it. Okay, so this script will be extremely simple. We just have to reference the target Collider and disable it when on Trigger function is called. If you check the tag of the Collider that triggers the Shadow Collider, uh, like me, don't forget to add the tag on your object. Congratulations, you now know how to make a hole using the stencil buffer. This is one of the many implementations of hole cutting in Unity. If you want me to make a video about other or more advanced techniques, such as making a hole that follows the curvature of the ground, or that does not require a special layer for the ground, let me know down in the comment section. Now let's see how to make an impossible geometry with the stencil buffer. If you follow the previous part, it will actually be the same process, but instead of rendering an object where the stencil buffer values are not equal to the rev value, now we will check if the stencil buffer values are equal to the rev value to render our objects. First, we have to create the box. We can do that by using Blender, for example, but I won't explain how since it would make the video too long. You can find the 3D model in the description if you're interested. Next, create as many quads as we have views for our impossible geometry and set their position according to the box, but in a way that they are facing towards us. I will go for three views and leave a blank view, but it's up to you. Now we have to create and apply as many mask materials as we have views. Again, we will use the mask shader we talked about earlier for that. After recopying or importing the shader, create as many materials as there are quads by right clicking, create material. Now apply these materials to each quad and set the stencil rev value, for example with 2, 3 and 4. Make sure to use different materials and rev values for each quad. Now create and place the objects to be seen in the different views into the box and create as many layers as there are views. Assign each layer to each object of each view and go in the URP render settings. Disable the default rendering of the layers if that's not already the case by going in the filtering section, then by unchecking the object's layer in the opaque and transparent layer masks. Now we have to create as many render features as there are layers. They would have exactly the same parameters between each other, except for the stencil rev value and the target layer, of course. Still in the URP render settings, click on Add Render Feature, then Render Objects. Call that render feature as you wish and make sure the event is set to After Rendering Opaques because we want to render the objects after the quads. Now in the Filters section, make sure the queue is set to Opaque, then select your view layer in the Layer Mask field. In the Overrides section, Check the stencil check mark and set its value to the value you set in your mask material. So, we want to render our objects only where the stencil buffer values are equal to the rev value they are associated with, which means that we can see the objects of a view only through the quad associated to this view. To do that, we set equal for the comparison operation. We can then leave keep in the pass fail and z fail command since we won't use them anyways. Repeat this process for each view and voila, you have an impossible geometry. Just a quick tip before the next tensor buffer application, if a layer contains a mix of opaque and transparent objects, you have to add another render feature to render the missing queue for this layer, which is generally the transparent one. To do that, you only have to repeat the exact same process, but instead of setting opaque for the queue, you have to set it to transparent and also set the event to after rendering transparency instead of after rendering opaques. This is an issue someone on the Discord server encountered as well.
Now for the final Sensei Buffer application, we will see how to make a magic card. This one is actually a mix between the first two. The idea is that we first render a mask quad, then the card itself, but only where the Stencil Buffer values are not equal to the mask Stencil Ref value. Then we will render the card inside, but this time only where the Stencil Buffer values are equal to the mask Stencil Ref value. So, to do that, first we have to create the card model, but also what's inside. Create whatever you want, and once you are done doing so, create an empty game object that will be the parent of the card inside object. Now create and apply a layer to the card and another one to the cards inside game object. For the latter, make sure you changed the children layer as well. In the meantime, we have to create the mask material. Again, we will use the mask shader for that. After recopying or importing the shader, create a material from it by right clicking, create material. Now apply this material to the quad and set its tensor ref value, for example with a 5. You shouldn't see any difference and this is because the card is currently rendered regardless of the stencil buffer values, we will fix that later, no worries. Now go in the UAP render settings, disable the default rendering of the layers if that's not already the case by going in the filtering section, then by unchecking the card and card inside layers in the opaque and transparent layer masks. The card and its inside should have now disappeared and this is intended since we are not rendering uh, these anymore. So we only have to create two render features, one for the card and one for its inside. Still in the URP render settings, click on add render feature, then render objects, call that render feature as you wish and make sure the event is set to after rendering opaques because we want to render the card after the quad. Now in the filtering section, make sure the queue is set to opaque, then select the card layer in the layer mask field. In the override section, check the stencil check mark and set its value to the value you set in your mask material. So we want to render our card only where the stencil buffer values are not equal to the ref value. To do that, we set not equal for the comparison operation. We can then leave keep in the pass, fail and z fail comments since we won't use them anyway. You can repeat this process for the cards inside layer, but this time we want to render it when the stencil buffer values are equal to the ref value. So we put an equal in the compare function field instead. Also, if you are rendering transparent objects in your cards inside, like some UI elements, for example, make sure to add another render feature to render them as well. To do that, you only have to create another render feature and repeat the exact same process as the cards inside, but instead of setting opaque for the queue, you have to set it to transparent and also set the event to after rendering transparent instead of after rendering opaques. Congratulations, you know how to make a magic card using the stencil buffer. <sighs> Anyways, that was quite a long video. <laughs> I hope the stencil buffer is clear for you now. Please consider liking or subscribing if you enjoyed. Also, if you have any question or comments, please put them in the comment section. I read and answer every of them. Also, do not hesitate to join the Discord server of the community if you are interested in discussing about game dev in general or if you are seeking help for your projects. Everyone is welcome. Anyways, that's all for the video. I hope you enjoyed it and I see you next time. Bye.